hi, I'm Jason Velasco, and welcome to this edition of Out of Curiosity, where we get to learn really interesting things about really interesting people. So let me introduce you to the interesting person of the day, Sri Sharma. Hi, Sri. How are you doing today? Hey, Jason. I am doing well, and I'm honored to be here as your guest. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you so much. And uh, you and I connected uh, earlier last year when you got your ACED certification. So tell me a little bit about that. How, you know, and we've got a whole e-discovery journey that we can get into. But you know, what what prompted you first and foremost to get into getting an ACED certification? And and really, who doesn't want to talk about e-discovery at great length, right, Jason? Exactly. <laughs> I know I do all day. <laughs> I had just launched this consultancy, Summit eDiscovery, and it was of interest to me to do everything I could to get my name out and to get the certifications that I thought would, would lend me the credibility. So ACEDS and the RCA both seem to be the intuitive, intuitive uh, certifications for me to pursue. And what's RCA for people that may not be familiar with that acronym? Relativity Certified Administrator. Cool. Okay. So I just want to make sure because not everyone knows the same thing. So, um, so tell me a little bit about your background. So, um, you know, how did you, how did you get into e-discovery and what, what, what been your role for the last few years? Well, like I always say to people, especially those outside of the legal and e-discovery worlds, uh, nobody plans to go into it. Everybody just kind of falls into it. Amen to that. And so after practicing law, I bought a, I got myself into the restaurant business. So fell into the restaurant business as well. Hmm. And that was an interesting journey. Definitely interesting. Um, I highly do not recommend that to anybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> While I was in that business, I ended up falling into document review and worked my way up, found that I actually liked the industry ended up managing teams and uh, worked on building out a regional service line for document review. And out of all of those experiences hatched this uh, business model. Oh, interesting. So uh, it's interesting you mentioned about food service and I know it's a really challenging thing. I was actually having this conversation with uh, someone and I, I made a very strong practice in the early days of my career, like 20 years ago um, when I was starting to figure out how to hire project managers in e-discovery. Um, one of the things that I found was the most successful people were the ones that worked in food service. Um, and and so I, I've gotten to a habit for the most part that usually one of the things I ask for when people I'm interviewing is, did they work in food service or did they work in retail or something where they're in, engaged with clients? And, and I don't know about you, but one of the things I, when, especially when I worked in food service, the big lesson I learned was humility you know, just how to be humble and learn how to serve people. And did you find the same thing? I was not. So I probably would have failed your, your interview criteria, Jason. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> my, my role was lending, lending the capital and being involved sort of not in the day-to-day -day operations more in the accounting, op uh, accounting operations and interfacing with management staff. Mm -hmm. Uh, I will tell you that there was a fair amount of humility that was involved there as well as going through multi-unit franchisee training. So um, you learn a lot about people. And also for me, one of, there were so many learning experiences involved in that endeavor, but one of them was scalability. Mm. And so in terms of being, having moved from practicing law into suddenly being in the restaurant business, interfacing with folks who were completely different than the folks you interface with in a law firm. Mm -hmm. So learning how to, how to really communicate in a way that your words and your sentiment are captured and that people feel spoken to in a respectful way that involved a lot of uh, adaptability in those early days for sure. Well, it sounds like that was a pretty actually significant lessons working with attorneys and, and especially as you're going through, I mean, because I think you know, my understanding is you've really focused on the contract or the review side, if you would. So um, how did that transition and, and you know, how, how did you take some of those skills into working with attorneys on the on the review uh, workflows? 
I uh, want to make sure I'm following the question. How did it transition from working with restaurant staff? Yeah, to... I mean, so, yeah, because I mean, it, you, you had talked about, you know, really working with people and really, you know, understanding where they came from. And then now you're working with attorneys, right? And and attorneys are a special breed, as we all know. And, you know, they're, 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 they're focused, they're educated, they have a lot of experience, a lot of them have very independent streaks, at least in my experience, you know, um, as you're going and in, in, in working with contract reviewers, how, how did you transition that and work and build those times? type of teams? I can say that, and sorry that I missed your point earlier, but yes, uh, definitely there was some transferability in terms of the skill set I acquired in the restaurant world and then with teams of document review attorneys, because in the document review space, you have attorneys who are positioned sometimes differently mm -hmm. than attorneys that I had worked with at a law firm. So you have folks who could be at the retirement stage in life, who've worked their entire careers and now just want to be out of the house and have something to do. Mm -hmm. You also have some folks who are brand new out of law school and are still starting to learn uh, what a professional world looks like. Then you have folks who are have thriving other careers. So in the way that I landed in the document review world, when I actually had another income stream that was coming in that had a lot of my attention, mm -hmm. that you have folks who are in the document review world who have that. They have a, let's say, practice on the side or some other non-legal business, an mm -hmm. ancillary business. So one of the skills that I had to try rapidly to acquire was to communicate in a way that appealed to all three of those different demographics, which also can sometimes mean different ages, different amounts of life experience, uh, huge, huge um, diversity in terms of your audience mm -hmm. uh, of document reviewers and finding a way to keep order and uh, manage a business while also staying in everyone's good graces and making people feel respected and valued as professionals. So did, how did you um, like assess their particular strengths? Because I mean, to me, I always focus on strengths versus weaknesses. So, I mean, how, how did you identify those? Were they, was that intuitive? Did you do things like Clifton strengths or how, how did you assess them in terms of making sure they were in the right role? We're doing the right type of work. That, there's a challenge and you've identified an another challenge that's presented in terms of managing teams of document reviewers. Frequently, you don't have enough interaction, not just in terms of duration, but you don't have enough interaction with the same group of people for the same length of time to be able to even get an adequate picture of each individual person's strengths. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, if you are working with a team so there's permanent staff and with permanent staff, absolutely personality testing. And you and I joke a lot about um, astrology. Mm -hmm. And so one of my go-tos in terms of getting an understanding of a person is astrology. I know you're a Pisces. So I'm putting that out there for the whole world to know now. That's all right. I'm not and, ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> and so for me, in terms of staff that I was interacting with on a permanent basis, Clifton strengths for sure, astrology, basic, just watching how someone interacts, how that person receives feedback, how that person gives feedback. Um, those, are, those are things I lean on in terms of understanding how to interact with a person, how to lead someone. Is somebody an introvert, an extrovert? Do they like a lot of attention? How do they like to be recognized? Do they like it privately or do they wanna be called up in front of everybody? The challenge with uh, staff that is, you may work with for two weeks and may not see them again for six months mm -hmm. is that you have very small um, chunks of time to really get to know people. And the nature of document review is you don't necessarily get to see people's work across a variety of different spectrums. So how, how eventually do you evaluate them? Because I mean, is it based on the number of docs that they're reviewing? How do you measure someone like that? I mean, you're, you're looking at a team. What's what, How do you define success? By never forgetting that you're dealing with people. Hmm. There are human beings behind the, the metrics and the numbers, right? And avoiding a trap of um, seeing uh, somebody as docs per hour and accuracy. So 
really making an effort to share meals with people, um, get to know people as much as you can on a personal level, understanding how they interface with their, uh, with their peers mm. and their colleagues and what sort of reports are you getting from colleagues and uh, how do they affect the review floor? Are people happy to have them around? Those are, you're, you're rather limited in, in how you can, can make those evaluations. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and how have you adapted? And because I, I want to dig into some of the discovery, but I mean, especially in the post COVID world, I mean, how, how, what recommendations can you maybe provide some of the, the folks that are in your, you know, that have experienced your type of role that are trying to manage these types of people in, in a virtual reality? I think it becomes frankly, even trickier because in a pre COVID world, everybody's in a review room together. Mm -hmm. And there's at least some face-to-face -face human interaction, uh, both with the review management staff, as well as with the, re the reviewers interacting with each other. Now we're all in these isolated bubbles of um, everybody behind their own computer. And it almost reduces again, people to what I have been cautioning against, which is a one-dimensional sense of a, of a person who's doing document review as how many numbers per hour and um, how, what's the what's the accuracy so that is a challenge that i don't know i have that i can present an answer to but um, definitely my advice would be for review management staff to to keep in mind what i had said about not forgetting that you're dealing with people and mm. people with with feelings and e-discovery moves so fast and the emails fly back and forth so fast that sometimes it is easy to become um, almost a little mechanical in your interactions with people. And probably now more than ever, this is not restricted to e-discovery, people are isolated. Mm -hmm. And if the some of the only contact they're having with the outside world is through their computer screen, then it's incumbent upon everybody, but especially their management staff to, to have an extra human touch about it. Yeah, I, I typically have found now, especially in, in, in the Costco world, is that I'm, I'm spending a lot more time on the phone and on Zoom calls, much at a much later time. Because, and, and where I normally would spend five, 10, 15 minutes with someone, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to maybe sometimes double that just to make sure that I'm getting that connection with someone. Because to me, and I think similar to yourself, I, to me, it's all about a connection. I want to be able to help people grow, make them make, make sure that they feel like they're cared about. And that's and, I, and and that to me is very important from a team. And so I've I've struggled with my management style over the years in terms of sometimes I overcommit to making sure that I'm helping people. But I'm also very proud of the mentorship that I've done over the years. And so and and you and I I think we talked about mentorship in the past. And um, tell me a little bit about some of the mentorship activities that you've done and some of the things you're working on today. Well, are you going to let me throw in a question as well? Oh, please, by all means. I thought this was a two-way street. This is always, yeah, absolutely. It's a conversation. <laughs> That's what all out of curiosity is all about. So on the topic of the extra time that you are building in mm -hmm. with people, and here I'm going to pull on my um, deep belief in astrology and the way it, it sort of uh, winds its way through as a thread in how I interpret things. Are you finding yourself having Zoom fatigue, having people fatigue? Because I know from a personal, on a personal level, I'm an extrovert. I mean, capital E, bold underscore extrovert. Mm -hmm. What has happened even for someone like me who really replenishes by interacting with other people is there's no travel time. There's no time alone in your car. Um, I used to spend two hours a day commuting back and forth. And now I, I, I'm ready from the time I'm ready and I'm sitting in front of my computer, I'm mm -hmm. on Zoom calls. And if it's networking, I do evening networking, I can go 13 hours without a moment to myself. And so even I'm having Zoom fatigue as a capital E extrovert. Are you encountering that? And if so, how are you navigating it? Um, I, I do. And very similar to yourself, I'm, I'm a pretty big e extrovert as well. And I, I, I get a lot of my energy from, again, being around people and helping people and getting my energy from them. And uh, I, I do get a little bit of Zoom fatigue. Um, I'm actually taking a lot more effort to do a lot of what I call walk and talks, um, where I'm actually um, committing to, you know, doing 10, 15,000 steps or a couple miles, you know, five to 10 miles a day walking 
on my iPod, just on the phone talking to people. And so that's how I connect with both friends. Um, that's how I connect right with families. Back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and that's exactly, I mean, so I, I spend a lot of time, so I'll usually like be on Zoom from like, you know, pretty usually about 7.30, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time till about 5, 5.30. Um, and then I'll go out and walk for a couple hours and I'll continue on my phone calls, but at least I'm having a conversation with people and I'm walking, I'm getting kind of rebuilding my, re-getting that kind of um, um, outside energy. Um, and then I try to really give myself about a good couple hours a night just to kind of not be on my computer. Um, and I, I try to find different little hobbies. I'm currently playing around with, uh, uh, I got an Oculus Quest 2. So I'm now playing with virtual reality and seeing how that fits. Um, they've, they've actually, it's cool. They actually have virtual conference rooms, very similar to like what the EDRM did with their uh, with their conference last November. You know, I, I'm my, my team, uh, my partners, we're actually setting up um, doing whiteboarding sessions across the globe in Oculus Quest world using a tool called Immersive. Um, and that's one of the things we're doing. So these are the things that we play with that allows me to kind of still interconnect with technology and find ways to still commit. Um, but I also find that it's not enough time. I'm still running out of time to make the connections that I feel like I need to make um, with the people that I feel committed to. And, and that's one of the things I've, I've just, It's sometimes it's overwhelming as someone who constantly wants to uh, continue to be networked with people and well as make sure that they feel like they're being followed up with because the worst thing that can happen is what I call networking ghosting. Um, and I'm guilty of it. And a lot of people are guilty, you know, guilty of it too, which is, you know, you make a connection, you see someone at legal tech and they're, you know, your best friends for the next you know, 30 days. And then next thing you don't talk to them until next legal tech. And that's, you know, that's very common in our space because we're focused on kind of the next thing that's right in front of us. Um, I don't have an answer. But I'm I'm aware of it and I'm trying to figure out a way around it. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think there might be an internet delay. So thanks for rolling with it. No, sure. On the topic of best friends and then not again till next legal tech, I have actually encountered somebody in my networking who advocates creating a list, whether it's 50 people or 100 people. Have you heard of that? A, a little bit, but please go ahead. No, please. It's better if you're coming from you. <laughs> well, uh, what he says is he suggests, I think his number is 50 people. And these are the 50 people who, for whatever your individual criteria is, you have decided that you would like to remain in close contact with. So not an out of sight, out of mind. And you make sure that you, you encounter those 50 people. You reach out to those 50 people at least once a month. So you're refreshing and renewing and you're keeping up the relationship. You're top of mind for them and they're top of mind for you. That's a great advice. I mean, it's one of those things that it's kind of in the back of my mind of, you know, I should have a list. And I thought about creating like a mind map and because let's throw technology at it, but you know what? Why not put a freaking post-it note? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that hard, right? <laughs> I don't know what a mind map is. A oh, map? a mind map is just a, um, it's a way of, of basically sharing ideas. So it's like creating a cloud. So basically you start with cat and then, oh, well, I think of cat. The next thing I think about is dog. And well, if I think about dog, then I go to, you know, bird. And you can kind of see the connection and which is how the mind works. And so basically it's a way of visualizing a network. So neural networking is basically in essence a mind map um, in many cases. So I've been playing around that with, for, you know, you know, 15, 20 years, because I was trying to figure out a way to help do exactly what you're talking about. How do I keep track of all these things? Because I'm, I'm very, personally for me, if it's, you know, I'm, I'm very good at compartmentalizing things. So I'm really good at, okay, once I close the book on whatever I need to get done there, I'm on to the next one. I can't even think about what happened to me 15 minutes ago. I'm really good at that. It's a positive and a negative, you know? So, I mean, a part of it is, is, you know, I've always got that nagging feeling that I'm letting something go. And that's, that's, you know, and that kind of sticks with me and having was playing around with like a mind map and tasks and trying to use technology and, and teams and, you know, whether it's Trello or planner or whatever Kanban board you have. I mean, I've played around with all of these things. Um, but uh, anyways, I, I would love to talk about that. I'm actually, I've got a whole series of, of articles in my head. That's on my, it's on my list of things to do called enterprise me to using enterprise technology to manage your life, personal life. Um, and so it's one thing I've done, but we can maybe have another out of curiosity and you're more than welcome to ask questions around that. And who knows, maybe we can uh, have another good conversation around that. You're a good interviewer, Shri. We should uh, maybe get to co-hosting once or twice. 
No. So well, thank you for that. So let, let's let's get to the uh, to the to the uh, telling me a lot about what Summit eDiscovery is because I mean you've you've made you know in our conversations you've made a pretty significant transition in your life and and let me tell me about your business and what you're trying to do and kind of your focus. Well, I uh, it's funny because the business model was hatched and the business was launched very shortly before COVID. Perfect time. <laughs> yes. So I'm really trying very hard to come up with a synonym for the most overused word of 2020, pivot. Mm -hmm. But uh, the model was to have a consultancy where I was able to engage with serial litigants, the serial litigants of the world who were perpetual consumers of e-discovery products and services, and advise them on an as-needed basis, depending on what the particularities of a case or a document review project or a client might be, advise them on whatever they needed to know when it came to document review. Was it workflow mapping? Was it vendor management? Um, and was it, for example, building out a docu document review line of business? Mm -hmm. so, worked with a company to do that. They wanted to get into the document review space. They were offering some other products that they felt were analogous and uh, didn't know where to start when it came to building out a document review service line. So worked with them on that. And that has been what's largely kept me busy over, over this past year, year and change. How did you get into it? So, um, well, I got into e-discovery through kind of much like yourself, you know, I kind of fell into it and, uh, you know, and I started doing computer forensics and just learning about data. And to me, it was just, I, as I started very early on my career, being able to testify to these type of things and learning about technology and started getting into petabytes of data, just how do you improve those type of things? Um, and so I'm, you know, it's been, it's been an interesting ride. Um, and I really enjoy just, you know, kind of the people aspect of it and, and really helping people just save money, prove their cost, and regardless of the technology. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what I've done in terms of kind of how I've got started in the space. Just again, lucky, right place, right time. So speaking of right place, right time, I was having a conversation a couple days ago about a grocery store in the South. You mm -hmm. may have heard of them, Publix. Mm -hmm, of course. Wonderful grocery store. And years ago, I think when I was in law school, they launched a grocery delivery service called Publix Direct. And mm -hmm. I, Jason, I was an early adopter. I was so excited that I didn't have to go pick out my own tomatoes or do any of that myself. They closed it in very short order. I think in under a year, Publix Direct's giant uh, trucks were um, taken off the road. It, they hit the market at the wrong time. And can you imagine there being a wrong time for grocery delivery? If they had just hit it five, seven years later, whenever it was, Instacart hit the market at the right time. There is definitely something to be said for launching a product line or a service offering when the market wants to hear from you. That's right. And that's kind of, you know, that, that's a challenge with innovation, because sometimes you're way ahead of the game with innovation, right? And that's kind of the, the challenge of entrepreneurs of when does the market timing right, right? And, and that's kind of the big challenge. I mean, especially, you know, I know, I've, it's interesting, you know, with COVID, I have uh, seen a lot of people that have both struggled, and I've seen a lot of people that have shined in the space in terms of they, you know, they, their businesses, they maintain consistency, it may have dropped a little bit, but they've, they've been able to maintain their business. And I've seen other businesses that have truly struggled. Um, and, and it's been interesting watching some of the innovations that have in the space. So um, when it comes to your, not maybe to practice, but I guess in terms of just how you approach things, I mean, how, how do you, what do you think about innovation in terms of, and what are the ways that you um, try to uh, approach innovation in your life, both professional and personal, if anything? Gosh, I don't know that I have an intuitive answer to that. Um, I can tell you that on the professional level, I wasn't at all sure how innovative the, um, the idea of a one person consultancy would be, uh, whether the market to the returning to the public's uh, analogy, whether the market would be ready. And mm -hmm. I, I'm still in the process of determining whether <laughs> the market is ready for that degree of innovation. Um, and you talked about some personality testing earlier and how evaluating people that you work with. To spin that around to 
my own propensity for innovation, what I learned, and I recently took a test uh, called Bank. What's that? I will have to link you at a later date to it because it's, it's brand new to me, but it strikes me as being somewhat similar to the DISC personality profiling. Have you heard of that? Mm -mm, I have not. It's just surprising because I love personality profiling. <laughs> well, DISC and Bank strike me as similar and they may be of interest to you. There, talk about how you show up in a work setting, at least DISC specifically talks about not what your inherent personality traits are, but who you show yourself to be in a work setting. Mm -hmm. And so when I take those tests, tests, what I discover is that I'm rather risk averse. Hmm. So I find it interesting that I have found myself in a business and meaning the e-discovery world that is so uh, innovative and that styles itself as so innovative when in many ways I'm uh, kind of conservative and averse to change. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, I would love to learn more about them. Please send me the information and we'll make sure we'll add the link to the, to the notes here because that, I mean, I'll, and we'll have to have a follow-up because I would love to kind of maybe share with you and we could talk about some of our, our discourse because I love talking about mapping. And one of the things that I do with my team is I, I, I ask them to do the Clifford strengths and I'll put that link in, in there as well. And I look at their strengths, their five core strengths and figure out where there's overlaps and figure out where, how we can actually put that team together. Um, and I do that with, with all of my, all of the people that I work with. So it'd be interesting interesting to kind of see that. And I'd be very curious to know that one, because you know, it's interesting for me personally, because of how, what, how people perceive themselves in the workplace is very different from how other people perceive them in the workplace and trying to bridge that gap, I think is actually very helpful from a self-awareness perspective, which I that's really key years thing. ago. Um, tell me who you are. Tell me who you think you are and I'll mm -hmm. tell you who you're not. Mm -hmm. And I've always held on to that in terms of my own self-assessment. And I'll tell you that uh, having an executive coach really, really, um, I was so averse to the idea when he first approached me after a networking meeting. I just thought like, who, who is anybody to coach anyone else? What's your inherent credential? I mean, but ultimately there, there have been so many benefits uh, of working with an executive coach. One of them, uh, the probably chief among them for me, has been having an outside, really, really wizened perspective who has total carte blanche to give you feedback, right? Everybody else in your life is going to be, to one extent or another, hesitant to give you feedback, hmm. whether it's to your, your spouse, your partner, people you work with. Everybody is invested in maintaining cordial relations and not putting you off by giving you potentially negative feedback. Um, there are two people in your life who aren't, your personal trainer and your executive coach. Those right. are the people who are gonna tell you uh, how you're coming across and where you need to change. And they have your best interest at heart. Yeah, I, um, I, I can't emphasize that enough either. I think that's really critical and, and I, uh, I encourage people to always have a coach because they're the ones that are going to tell you, they're going to be able to see things that other people won't. And even, you know, you, I, I, yeah, I couldn't second that the most. I mean, that's, that's a great, it's a great advice. And I definitely highly really recommend people look at that too. Um, as part of their just general personal growth, if they're interested, right. If there's a lot of people aren't interested in personal growth, <laughs> as I've come to find out, which is, you know, that's, that's, but that's why we have these conversations, right. To help people kind of figure out, what they want to do and who they want to be when they grow up. Um, I'm still working on that too. So, um, well, well Shree, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. So how, how can people find you and how can they get in touch with you? They, I'm sure you will be kind enough to link in the comments when you post this. They can find me at the website, www.summitediscovery.com or on my LinkedIn, and I will provide you that information. That's awesome. By the way, I love your logo. I think that's the best. So it's really cool. It's nails exactly what you have. So I think it's great, great marketing design. So um, thank you, Shri. I really appreciate taking the time. And thank you all for joining us for this, uh, this, this, uh, this, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for this episode of uh, Out of Curiosity. And uh, for those that are on YouTube, please like and subscribe and we'll go from there. So thank you very much. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you much. Thanks, thank you, Shree. Bye-bye.